So thank you very much, everybody, for attending um, the latest in our series of free webinars. I think we're up to number 20 now. Um, Nick, perhaps if you could move on to the next slide. So a big welcome to everyone. Um, we have an agenda this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be covering a number of areas in relation to data security. So we'll be talking about um, using personal devices, about working from home, password protection and encryption, cyber essentials, secure websites, new guidance on SARS, outsourcing back office services overseas, the ICO's accountability framework and tracker, and then we'll finish with some questions and answers. Next slide, please. Can you see it again, David? It's the presenters. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, so joining me today, we have um, Matt Halgate, Nick Hanning, and I'm particularly delighted to welcome Elizabeth Archer from the ICO. I'm not going to spend too long introducing Matt and Nick. I think most of the people attending today have seen Matt and Nick um, present previously. I think what I would like to say is that they are absolutely outstanding um, in relation to many things, particularly uh, data protection law. And that's why Nick and Matt are going to be uh, doing some significant presenting uh, this afternoon. Elizabeth has worked in information rights at the ICO since 2006. Her work focuses on data protection and as a principal policy advisor at the ICO, she's responsible for leading on and developing strategy and policy products in specific areas. Elizabeth works in the assurance department, which includes teams working on audits, guidance, codes of conduct, and certification under the GDPR and the so-called sandbox. Elizabeth was the policy lead responsible for the development of the ICO's beta accountability framework, which launched earlier this year. This is a practical tool to help organizations consider their data protection compliance and how to demonstrate it. So next slide, please. This is my section on own devices, David. Shall I yeah, take so, a Yeah, over, over to you then, Matt. Nick, do you mind if I share the screen? Okay. So I'll talk a bit about own devices and home working. I guess for many of you, this is something you've already gone through, but actually, interestingly, a number of the problems I've seen coming up over recent weeks and over the last couple of months have been associated with the implications of staff using personal devices and home working. And of course, one of the critical issues with staff using personal devices is what happens when they leave the organisation. So when they leave your firm, when they leave your organisation, and they may well have information on their personal devices. So um, I got a picture of, um, of a computer that I thought might be being used. And then I remembered that, um, that, that many of you on this may well be legal aid lawyers. And, and so it's probably a far more uh, realistic picture of the device that's being used. Um, of course, they're not just using their, their personal computers, they're using those spanky new mobile telephones that all of the young people are using nowadays. Um, and of course, those wonderful tablet devices that they used to watch, the, the Netflix and, and the Amazon or things. Um, but, but what's absolutely critical is that um, whether they're using their own devices or whether they're using devices that you've provided for them, we need to be really careful that you are in a position to understand what's happening to the data on those devices and what happens to the data on those devices if they were to leave the organisation. And I'll come to some of that in a moment. And I do think it's sometimes it's easy for us to think, well, we've given them phones, we've given them laptops, we've given them iPads or we've given them other devices. But if those aren't locked to the extent that people can still download their own apps or their own pieces of software onto them, then um, 
they may be circumventing the things you've given them to use. They may be using their own systems. And of course, bluntly, God knows what some of them are doing with their data. Uh, I think we need to be incredibly careful. And as I'll come to in a moment, one of the things that a lot of people are doing is storing information on the cloud. Um, and of course, that might not be your cloud. It might be the cloud that their personal device is connected to. So, and again, some of you will have heard me say this before, but it's it's worth saying there are certain situations where an individual may be using their personal device or even their work device for, say, taking a photo of a document or scanning a document or some other issue. And that document, that photo, that image is being directly uploaded to their own personal cloud or their own personal shared drives. And of course, there's two things that are happening there. One, you don't know where that is and you have no control over it. And secondly, you don't know who else has got access to it. So it may well be that they're working on a, um, a shared drive with other family members and individuals are doing work which is being shared on those resources. Um, I know this is a crazy thing to say, but um, it's worth remembering there is no such thing as the cloud. There is just somebody else's computer. So they're not putting this on the cloud, they're putting it on somebody else's computer. And that's probably worth, that's probably worth thinking about at some point. Um, somebody just asked a question in the chat, which is probably worth picking up here, which is what do you think should be done to stop people using mobile technology, allowing others to see what they're doing um, on trains or, or others? Well, first of all, um, have very clear policies and procedures in relation to what is allowable within your practice and make sure that those policies and procedures are based on some form of risk assessment of the way that the data is being used. And that requires you to ask questions and to understand. Now, okay, I don't wanna step back into those heady pre-GDPR days where we were all doing data audits and working out what was going on, but of course our data position changes and, and maybe Elizabeth will touch on this later, but the reality is we're not in a static data universe. Things are changing all of the time. And of course, for many of us on the 23rd of March, we fundamentally shifted the way that we use data and we did homeworking and we use personal devices. So first and foremost, understand what's actually happening and have clear policies. Make sure your staff understand those policies. Make sure they know what they're supposed to do and more, they know what they're not supposed to do. And the other thing is don't assume knowledge because the reality is we talk about things like um, stopping things being automatically saved to the cloud. But of course that requires an individual to make certain changes to the settings on their devices and they may not know how to do that or they may know how to do it in one app but not in other apps so you might need to think carefully about not just what they do do or what they should be doing but how they can actually do it and give them the tools and the knowledge to enable them to do those things i think we we sometimes um, overestimate people's ability to make changes and of course, one of the significant problems we have at the moment is people aren't in the office. They can't go to Kevin, who's good with the tech, and let Kevin do it because Kevin is, you know, three counties away. Uh, so we need to have some way of training them. Um, but I take the point about uh, training and policies not working as well as they could do. And, and I accept that's always the case. So for me, it's about policing and control to making sure that you're looking at these things and also to make sure there are consequences when people do something wrong. And I have to say, um, I have some organisations that I work with who, in my view, are probably having far more data breaches than I would feel comfortable if I were in their position. And yet nobody ever gets disciplined when they get something wrong. There are no serious adverse consequences for doing something which is ostensibly unlawful or certainly dangerous or putting your clients at risk. So there has to be some way of tying this back down to um, the consequences of you not doing what you should do. So, as I say, if people are using their own devices, you really need to understand what they're doing. And let's look at some of the potential things that they're doing with their own devices. Um, I've seen a massive increase in the use of systems like WhatsApp over the last several months. Now, it was already very significant in particularly areas like criminal law and family law, where it was a, a very common way of contacting clients. Um, I've also seen Messenger being used. I have to say, 
for various reasons I have a view that if you're going to use one of them use WhatsApp not Facebook Messenger but I mean you know think carefully about whether you use either of them and I'll come to the reasons for that in a moment. People are using things like Adobe and Adobe Scan and other similar pieces of software to scan documents and of course one of the problems with anything which takes an image um, is that that image is being saved somewhere and it may not be being saved on anything you have control over. So as I've said already, it will be saved on their device. It will probably be saved on any cloud associated with the device. Depending on the way they've signed up to the app, it may well be saved on the app's own cloud server. Um, so you need to be extremely careful about those things. The other thing is the emergence of people using online cloud services like OneDrive or Dropbox or iCloud as a way to solve problems about um, homeworking and saving data in a way that they think is, is, is rel relatively safe. And what I'd say about a lot of those things is a number of those systems are primarily based in the US. Now, for some of them, particularly for some of the paid versions of those, you can go into settings and shift the settings so that they are using EU-based servers um, and on the assumption that we have some kind of, um, you know, safeguards in relation to EU data sharing across the coming years, that's probably less disconcerting than America. But you do need to be conscious of that because, of course, things like the arrangement with America isn't always as firm as you might think it is. So just to give you an example here of WhatsApp, WhatsApp is, is fascinating. Um, it does offer end-to-end -end encryption of messages. As I understand it, and I can't promise to be an expert on this, the messages are not themselves stored on the WhatsApp server. So they bounce via the WhatsApp server and God knows where else, and then they come to your um, device and they're not stored anywhere else. And that's great. And I understand that the, um, the, the, the team of WhatsApp and at Facebook gave various guarantees and assertions to the Information Commissioner's Office um, as GDPR came into place. But um, I don't know. I don't exactly trust what, you know, Facebook. It's just a personal thing. Um, I, I'm not going to say they're terrible, but um, they do make a living out of selling data and using data and aligning data and using data to think about how you might be sold things. Um, so, you know, the last thing you want to do is start giving them client data because the one thing that is stored, if you were to put, say, a client's telephone number on your phone and you use WhatsApp, then that telephone number and those contact details are uploaded to the WhatsApp server. And WhatsApp use it to offer you the opportunity to contact those people through WhatsApp at a later stage. Now, that's fine, but I don't think your client, when they gave you their phone number, assumed you were going to be sending it to Facebook. Um, so you need to be careful about those issues and, and, you know, we can come to some of those at another point. But the other thing is, God forbid, some point in the future, that having harvested all that, that data, um, Facebook starts offering all of your clients the opportunity to friend your other clients. Um, so I'm not saying it's happening or that it's likely to happen, but we do need to be careful about where we're sending data that our staff are using. Certainly we need to understand where it is. Working from home, of course, brings challenges. And um, what I'd say is, for many of us, this is what we might have in our mind when we're thinking about homeworking, but that's not the reality for a lot of people. The reality for a lot of people is that it's that. You know, it's the, 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 the couple working at home, sharing the same space, listening into each other's telephone calls, looking at the data that's shared on their shared drive, seeing the papers that are on the desk. And you've got to be really, really careful about, you know, whether or not, you are doing what you should do in relation to data security if um, it is being basically shared quite openly with other people in a household. And it's, you know, perhaps less risky if they're in a relationship or if they're spouses, but often it's not that, it's flat shares. So the people who are seeing this confidential information are not family members, they're just random individuals who happen to share a living space with the person who is working for you. And I would imagine quite a lot of our staff probably live in shared accommodation. So we do need to be incredibly careful about those things and think about the implications of data security, but also think about the implications of COVID. I have had a situation come up and forgive me, I've used this as an example a couple of times of uh, a firm where an individual was 
going into the office during lockdown and squirrelling files into their briefcase and taking them home. And then the firm get in touch and say, um, we've got a bit of a problem. Uh, we think Bob's got COVID, but he's got eight boxes of client files in his bedroom. Um, what do we do? Because we need them. So this was a firm not paperless necessarily on that hybrid situation. So you do need to think about it. So think about whether or not working from home allows your staff adequate data security. Think about how robust their systems and processes are. Think about their firewalls. Think about all of the other security things that, of course, you would have spent a lot of time thinking about in your office. Often you may have to go through a process of balancing risk and making decisions, but you can't do that properly unless you know what's being used. And I understand that sometimes the, the resources necessary to go through this exercise might seem quite significant, but actually they're probably not. So we've produced at DG Legal a home working um, risk assessment checklist, which you can use. And, and it, you know, it might well be if you used it at the beginning of this, you might want to think about sending it out again to see how things have changed because some people have moved, some people's circumstances will have changed, some things will have changed in terms of risk. Uh, so it, it's worth looking at those things. Um, we are very conscious in workplaces about data security and David's going to talk about that in a moment. But of course, you know, people are far less conscious about that thing at home. And, and just as recently as last week, I had a trustee colleague of mine um, who opened a phishing type email and um, ended up with some malware on his computer. So you need to be very careful of that. The one thing I will say is this, regardless of how good your policies are, how robust your training is, how good your policing is, um, individuals will always try to find shortcuts. It is unfortunately what we do. Uh, so you can put in all of the rules and, and provisions in the world, but people will try and find a way around them, which means you need to check on this stuff fairly regularly. And again, you know, passwords, have a good password policy for strong passwords. Um, I dug this off the internet. I have no idea if these are in fact the top 30 most used passwords in the world, um, but I've certainly used a couple of them in my time. So, you know, I'm not going to say it isn't there. David's going to talk about a system in a moment in relation to encrypting email communications. And many of you will use um, certain online data vaults uh, for encrypting information. But don't forget the simple power of password protecting a document uh, and attaching it to an email. I mean, it's an obvious thing to say, but if you're sending emails and you risk sending them to the wrong recipient, better you've sent it to the wrong recipient as an attached password protected document than as the body of the email, which anybody can read. And again, last week I had a client with a data breach. They'd unfortunately sent the wrong document as an attachment to an email to a client. And of course the client had read it and was threatening to do all sorts of, not a client, an opponent, was threatening to do all sorts of odd things with it. And it would have been so much easier if they'd have just passworded the document because they might well have received it, the opponent, but they couldn't have opened it. Um, one tip, if you're going to password a document and attach it to a, an email, don't put the email password, don't put the document password in the email, send it separately or ring the recipient up and say their password on that particular um, encrypted or secure document is, hold on, let me pick one, QWERTY123. So there you go. At which point I will pass over to David. David, do you want me to... Um, to, to do your slides from here. We've lost David. Hi, yeah, that'd be great, Matt. Thank you uh, so much for that. So let me, first of all, pick up on um, the product that Matt said I would refer to. Um, it's one of the best uh, products I've seen. And just to declare interest, we don't get any kind of commission for recommending this product to it. We do recommend people have a look at something called R Mail. And uh, it's an American product which does a number of cute tricks. The, probably the most important one is that it encrypts your emails without you having to use a key or a passcode. But you can choose to use a key or a passcode if you wish to. Um, and another very useful feature is a, a, a piece of tracking software within it which depending on your point of view is either enormously clever 
or is quite scary, essentially what happens is that it's a bit like, um, you know, recorded delivery or registered mail. What happens is that when the email leaves your server, it records when it left your server, it records when it arrived at the other party's server, and it records when the other party actually opened the email and sends that information back to you. And that kind of evidence has been admissible in court on, on previous occasions. And there are various other things that it does, but if you're interested in a more detailed explanation from, from, from me, then just please send an email and I'll send you a document. But I think it is, it is rather cute and clever. One thing I should have mentioned earlier about questions and, and answers, uh, please do use the Q&A box and um, we will come to questions and answers at the end. Um, if there are too many questions and we don't have time to answer all of them, we will answer them after the event and we'll send those answers to you together with a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. Okay, so Cyber Essentials. Uh, now Cyber Essentials, I think, it's been around for some time now, and I would imagine that most of you would have heard of Cyber Essentials, but you might not necessarily know what it actually is. Effectively, it's a government-backed scheme that's designed to protect your firm, no matter what size you are, against a range of the most common cyber attacks. Um, it helps firms guard to, against various threats and, and demonstrates really your commitment to cybersecurity. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so where, where did it come from? Well, it kind of came out of concerns from amongst others, GCHQ about the impact of cyber attacks on government and those who provide services, including legal services for government. So the government worked with a number of stakeholders to develop the cyber essentials scheme and it really just focuses on a small number of controls which were identified by the government as those that if they had been in place they would have stopped the majority of successful cyber attacks over the years. It's backed by industry including the Federation of Small Businesses, the CBI and many many others and as, I, as I've already said it's designed to be suitable um, for all. So we'll move on to the next slide. So what? It's the technical controls, which I mentioned earlier, um, are really just cover five fairly straightforward areas, really. So it's going to sound a little bit like common sense. But in practice, as Matt has already indicated, we do come across a number of data security incidents. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll all uh, focus on what those five areas are. So first of all, uh, a firewall. So a firewall effectively creates a buffer zone between your network and external networks. It decides whether incoming traffic should be allowed onto your network. An operating system such as Windows usually has a firewall but a operating system that uses a complicated network with different types of devices could benefit from what's known as a boundary firewall. So that's the first area. Second area um, is, is about security settings for your devices and software. So manufacturers of hardware and software often supply their goods with very basic default passwords, such as admin, and they're really quite easy to guess and they provide cyber attackers with the opportunities to access your data. So uh, it does sound like common sense, but not everybody does it. So it's really important to change default passwords. Number three is about maintaining access control. So staff should have access to the software and settings they need to perform their online role. Additional permissions should only be given to those that need them. So the point here is that admin privileges should only be given to those that absolutely need them because hackers with access to such an account can cause significant damage. Next one, number four, avoid myrises. Myrises, oh, 
Myrus, that sounds particularly nasty, but I should have said viruses and malware. So malware, if you didn't know, is software or content on the internet designed to cause damage. Amongst the steps you can take to minimize the risk of being affected is keeping antivirus software up to date and always use the most up-to-date version of the browser available. Finally, weaknesses are regularly identified and exploited in operating systems and installed software, and you often hear about this in the news. So it's really critical to ensure that updates are installed regularly. Examples include Windows, of course, and Apple operating systems. So as soon as you're aware of a patch or a fix, um, you must um, update your device. So we'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So with Cyber Essentials, there's three levels of engagement. You could choose simply to familiarize yourself with cyber security terminology and make sure, make sure that staff are trained thoroughly and they understand what it is that they should be doing. One step up from that is to go for certification at the basic or entry level. And for those who want to take cyber security further, you can go for cyber essentials plus certification. The main difference between the two is that the basic level is self certification. You have a very long questionnaire that you have to uh, complete, whereas the advanced level involves testings of systems by an accreditation body. We'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the Law Society view is, is favourable. I think it's very hard to make a case against Cyber Essentials. Um, I'm quoting from a survey from around about 18 months ago. Uh, at that point in time, two thirds of all law firms had been a victim of a cyber incident. So now it's probably going to be closer to three quarters. And we've got a quote there from Tim Hill, policy advisor to the Law Society, saying that Cyber Essentials will help you ensure your business has the basic level of protection against the most common online threats. So let's move on. So what are the benefits? Well, I think it's the first point is obvious. It addresses the most common threats to your business. I think just as importantly, it reassures your clients that you take data protection seriously. Now, of course, most law firms have one or more accreditations, and to the vast majority of clients, those, those accreditation logos are fairly meaningless. They won't understand, for example, what Lexel actually means. However, with Cyber Essentials, it's pretty obvious what it means, and um, it is far higher in profile than other accreditation logos. So we think it looks really good. Um, you are permitted to use the CE logo once you're accredited on your stationery, your email signatures, your website and promotional materials, and, def and, and therefore not only clients, but potential clients will be reassured that you take data protection seriously. The cost of obtaining accreditation is relatively modest. It's only £300 if you're going for the basic level. And it's something that we've taken seriously. I think we obtained Cyber Essentials about two years ago. Okay, we'll go on to uh, the final, final slide in my section. I just wanted to, to really finish by talking about uh, secure websites. So I think I'll just start by saying that the Data Protection Act 2018 requires data controllers to implement appropriate technical measures that ensure that by default, personal data is not made accessible to an indefinite number of people without an individual's intervention. Now, the problem with having an insecure website is that you may be processing or having access to personal data, because if you have um, a contact us page and your website is not secure, then they are potentially giving you information about their name, their telephone number, their email address through something which is not secure. So that's dangerous. Now, we know that a significant number of law firms do not have uh, secure websites. 
So last March, for instance, um, we checked over 400 law firm websites to see how many of them had secure websites. And we found that 26% of firms did not have a secure website, which is very risky. So having an SSL certificate will secure your website. The way that you know whether you're visiting a secure website is fairly straightforward. As you can see from the slide, there is a padlock and the website address begins with HTTPS. So it's the S for secure. And even more worryingly to potential clients, if your potential client is on your website and they're using Chrome or Firefox, which are two of the most popular browsers in the world, a warning does come up on unsecured websites to say your connection to this site is not secure. So that's gonna scare away potential clients. Many experts in the field uh, say that Google give some search engine ranking credit to sites with an SSL certificate. So another reason to do it. And I guess the final point is that the ICO in their guidance uh, to GDPR in relation to personal data suggests that firms look at the security of their website and there is a link on the slide. And as I said earlier, the slides will be sent to you afterwards. So at this point, we're gonna hand over to uh, Nick. I've stopped sharing Nick, so you can share your own screen there. Thanks, uh, you should be able to see my screen now and uh, hopefully uh, hear me as well. Uh, no one is saying no, so fingers crossed. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Thanks, David. So, um, what I'm, I'm acutely aware that I'm uh, the last warm-up uh, act um, before the main the main event. So I'll try to rattle through this uh, relatively quickly. Um, this is in the form. This is a, by way of a, of a data protection update, um, and I'm really going to be looking at. Um, most of the time, I'll be looking at some updated and new um, guidance about how to deal with subject access requests um, and um, allied to that at the end we'll just touch on sending data overseas um, so that we've got that um, in our heads as well. Um, so in terms of uh, SAR guidance uh, what's important here is that the ICO issued fresh guidance um, less than two months ago um, and it's very much more detailed than the previous guidance. In fact, my PDF uh, downloaded version is 81 pages. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to pretend to have read it all yet, um, but it is, it's a lot more detailed and helpful. Um, what the ICO itself has flagged up as being the three things that um, they've really focused on trying to help with are stopping the clock, um, what is an excessive request um, and charging um, for SIR, for, for, for dealing with a subject access request. So in terms of stopping the clock, uh, the general rule is that you have to comply with the subject access request within a month. Um, and that's pretty much un, un, unextendable, except if you can show that the request is complex um, or potentially part of a multiple request. Um, and where the guidance is helpful is that it gives uh, quite a few more examples of the circumstances in which um, you can identify um, how um, a request is deemed to be complex. Um, and that's quite helpful. The other thing it um, emphasizes is that if the request is unclear, you're allowed to ask for clarification. Um, and that is the request that effectively stops the clock um, so that your month doesn't start to run yet. But, and the ICO is, as you can imagine, is, is quite strict about this. It can't be, this can't be used willy nilly or unilaterally. You can only ask for information or clarification if it is genuinely needed. Um, and if you process a lot of data about the individual. So if you've only got a small amount of data about the individual anyway, then you can't really be asking for clarification. I think to my mind, this really applies in the context maybe of an employee SAR where they might have been employed for a long time and you've potentially got huge quantities of data. For example, not only just their HR data, but 
strictly speaking, all the stuff they've dealt with with clients, all the client matters they've been handling, all of that could conceivably um, be part of the data to be requested. So I think you're entitled then to say, well, what are you really looking for? Is it a particular period? Is it in relation to a particular HR issue or what? So that you can narrow it down. Charging, um, uh, we'll come to in a moment, but the first question about how much is when is a request manifestly excessive? Now that's important because you're entitled to refuse unless a, a subject access request if the request is manifestly excessive or unfounded. Um, manifestly excessive is quite difficult uh, because one of the, the primary rules is just because it's a lot of data, that does not mean that it's manifestly excessive. It's the extent of the request which is being tested, not the amount of data. Um, so the new guidance gives a lot more discussion about this and is really very helpful. Um, and the, the real test is whether the request being made is clearly or obviously unreasonable, or perhaps it's in several requests which either duplicate each other or overlap, um, and so make it more difficult to deal with. Um, as I said, it's absolutely not volume. <coughs> the other um, reason you can refuse is where it's um, manifestly unfounded. That's actually very difficult because by and large, your starting point is everyone has a right to this data. So it's very hard to show that it's unfounded. But again, the guidance is helpful here and gives some useful examples of where you can show that the request is malicious or perhaps harassing. And the really good example they give is if somebody says, here's my subject access request, but I'll withdraw it if you give me something. It might be money, it might be access to something. And it's a really good example of where the reality is this is not a genuine request at all. It's just doing something to put pressure on you to make you respond in a particular way. So that you have been told to treat as a, as a manifestly unfounded request and refuse it. Um, but for those of you who haven't spotted yet, yes, every single title of these slides is a genuine uh, song title. Um, so normally, of course, for an SAR, you're not allowed to charge. Um, doesn't matter how much work it may entail. Uh, the subject, the, the data subject is entitled to get the data for free. Um, but you are allowed to charge if the request is manifestly excessive or unfounded. And just in, in some ways you could refuse, you could either refuse or you could say, okay, we'll do it. We're going to charge. But what can you charge? Um, well, the answer is you can charge photocopying, printage, postage and any other direct costs. You could also charge for equipment and supplies. So, for example, discs, if you were going to send out a CD with it on, uh, arguably your envelopes. Well, I don't imagine they're terribly expensive, um, but maybe a USB stick, for example, um, if that was the best way to deal with it. And in theory, you can also charge for some staff time. But overarchingly, of course, the charge has to be reasonable. Um, and part of that test is going to be around it being consistent as well. Um, so the recommendation is to have a policy in place so that when you do come to charge, you're applying that policy rather than just thinking something up on the hoof. So just a couple of other issues that we've come across um, in the course of our advising lots of retainer clients. Uh, two, two particular issues with uh, subject access requests. And the first is around health information. Um, and it's an area where also the, the guidance has, has given some, some more information for us. So if you're not a health professional, the regulations say you're not allowed to disclose that any health data um, unless within the last six months you've obtained an opinion from the quote appropriate health professional um, and quote that the quote serious harm test for health data is not met. Um, the alternative is that you're provided you're satisfied the individual has already seen or knows about the health data. So why is that important and, and what does it even mean? Well it's important in the context of for example you're dealing with personal injury cases, if you're dealing with mental health cases, um, if you're dealing with anything where you may have medical records, you can't send those records out in answer to a subject access request, even though there may be a prima facie entitlement to them, unless you've met these tests. Well, what, what is this test anyway? The serious harm test 
um, is confirmation, well, the, it's, it's a kind of a reverse test. Um, if disclosure would be likely to cause serious harm to the physical or mental health of any individual, then normally even a health professional doesn't have to disclose that data to the subject, to, to the data subject, precisely to avoid causing that harm. So if we, and we're not health professionals, if we are asked to disclose this information, we can't do it unless we can be satisfied that this test is not met. And we can only be satisfied about that with advice from the appropriate health professional. And that is defined as the health professional most recently involved in treatment. So in other words, before we can disclose health data, we have to go off and get an opinion from a health professional. Now, there's good news and bad news on this front. The good news is that, that the ICO recognizes that probably makes the request um, complex. So we're entitled to get more time. The bad news is, as far as the guidance goes, we still can't charge for it. Um, what about if the health professional charges a fee? Well, the short answer is we don't know for certain, but the guidance seems to suggest we have a positive obligation to go to efforts to find out who the health professional is and get this advice. So in theory, if there is a fee, we may have to pay it as the data controller in order to comply with our obligations. But hopefully they won't charge a fee. If the request is made in the right way, it may be that the appropriate health professional can answer the question quite simply and without charging a fee, but otherwise it may be down to us. The other problem that we've come across or problem area potentially with access requests um, is when it's our client's opponent who makes the request. And this is becoming more and more common um, as particularly difficult other parties uh, realize that they can do this. Um, and it causes quite a lot of um, inconvenience for us. Our starting point might be, well, they're the other side, nothing to do with us. Um, I can just ignore it. No, you can't. You are holding data about your client's opponent. <clears throat> so the Data Protection Act still applies. They're still entitled to a copy of the data uh, that you hold. And more importantly, which people may not fully appreciate, is they're also entitled to know where you got that data from. Um, and that can be quite um, awkward sometimes if the source of your data may be wanted confidentiality and didn't want you know, there may be a problem there because technically under Data Protection Act, they're entitled to know the source of the data. Your next answer may be, well, it's all privileged um, because it's all part and parcel of, of what we're doing. So subject to legal professional privilege, um, I don't have to disclose it. Well, yes, some of it may well be, but you have to bear in mind that technically speaking, privilege applies to documents, not per se to data. So there's a distinction to be drawn, which may make life a bit more awkward. Finally, you say, well, this is all confidential. Well, not really. Um, there may be some stuff which is confidential to your client, and that's to whom you owe your duty of confidentiality. But if the data is about the other party, it's clearly not confidential to them because it's their data. So that presents a problem. The short answer is you do have to deal with this. Um, and there's a process to go through, and I'll just rattle through these and bring them up quite quickly. But first and foremost, you have to identify all the data you hold about your opponent. Next, ask yourself, is it privileged? If any of it is privileged, you remove that because you're not gonna disclose it. Anything that you've got left, is any of that subject to a professional duty of confidentiality to your client? If so, you don't need to disclose it, specific exemption in the Data Protection Act. So you take that out as well. Next question, does anything else that you've got still got left enable another individual to be identified? Because if so, before you can disclose, you either need that individual's consent or to have reached the decision that it's reasonable to dispense with that consent. So it might be that it refers to the individual who's your opponent's partner. Well, that's probably fine. But if it's somebody else, you may need to get consent and can't disclose. So again, you wouldn't disclose. What you then have left may not be very much, but will need to be disclosed. Now, what's a problem with that is that it's time consuming to perform that exercise, undoubtedly needs a lawyer's involvement uh, because you've got to decide whether it's privileged or not, what your professional duties are. 
and uh, please don't shoot the messenger, but you still can't charge. So finally, because we're very short on time, I'm sorry. Um, if you're sending data um, external, if you're outsourcing some of your services overseas, are you sending data overseas? Are you sending data? And the chances are you may well be because the sort of services which are outsourced are things like typing, statement taking, maybe preparing court bundles, maybe your accounts, payroll, human resources stuff. All of that involves the processing um, of data, a lot of which may well be personal data. Some of it may even be uh, sensitive personal data, um, special category data. So the question is, are you allowed to do that? Well, as of now, we're fine because we're in the um, EEA um, and all data exchanges within the EEA are covered by GDPR and Data Protection Act, so there's no problem. The overarching principle is that any data that goes outside of the EEA needs the same protection. So if you send it outside the EEA, EEA you either need an adequacy decision, um, and there are adequacy decisions which have been issued by the EC um, and confirmed that the countries just listed here do have arrangements in place that are the, that are the equivalent of the EEA. Um, there used to be an agreement in place, <clears throat> which uh, Matt mentioned, the uh, Privacy Shield. That's been struck down again, um, so it's no longer valid. So you can't willy-nilly send data to the United States. Um, incidentally, Canada, which doesn't show on my list, it's because there's only partial recognition, but by and large, it's not bad. Um, provided you're covered by certain legislation in Canada, it's, it's deemed to be adequate. Um, if you can't do an adequacy decision, then you need appropriate safeguards. Um, and I will not really go into those in detail because they are messy. Um, but basically, it's contractual clauses um, or similar, um, which are, are quite difficult to implement and need to be looked at carefully. There are precedents, there are templates, but it's a bit messy and therefore in our, on our view is to be avoided if at all possible. Um, apart from anything else, you can't data may not be that safe because there aren't, adequate, there aren't adequate provisions in the country you're sending it to. So that would include places like India, South Africa, which I know are very common sources. Um, what that poten potentially begs is that we are leaving, um, we are leaving the uh, EU at the end of this year um, and all the transitional provisions technically come to an end. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that we are no longer in the EEA, so we no longer benefit from that protection. But to be fair, the EEA is broader than the EU. It includes uh, members of what's called the EFTA, which is what the European Financial Trading Association, something like that. So countries like Norway, Switzerland. Um, we may well be able to join those groupings and still be covered. Um, we may get an adequacy provision uh, decision. One has been applied for. Um, but as far as I'm aware, has not yet been granted. Um, and being very cynical, what rushes the EC in to deal with that? They may just want to be awkward and why wouldn't they be? It's not as though we're showing them a huge amount of respect right now. So they may just shrug their shoulders and say, Puh, pa, uh, at some point. Um, and the asterisk on the jet plane is that it is the slowest plane ever in terms of leaving. Um, you think how long it's taken to get through Brexit, and we still haven't really got there. Um, that is that. So that is my bit done. And I'm sorry, Elizabeth, that I may have maybe cutting you rather short. Oh, uh, no worries, Nick. Um, how long have I got? Have I got till half past? Or oh. am I right in that? Timings wise? Well, we were planning to go to uh, quarter to two, sorry, quarter to three. So I think you're absolutely fine. And in any case, we don't worry too much if we overrun slightly because unlike a physical event, people can easily choose to leave. So um, really don't worry about it too much, and, but maybe leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. So we have gotten to to say quarter to three. Right, okay. Um, am I sharing my screen or is... I can carry on sharing mine if that would be easier for you. Uh, it may well be. <laughs> Please. I'm quite looking forward to saying next slide anyway. <laughs> going to get that presidential. <laughs> yes, I'm going to have a go. Right. Um, so, hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. 
Um, do shout if there's any problems on the uh, chat function or, or what have you. Um, so as David was saying at the beginning, I'm, I'm Elizabeth Archer and I'm a, a principal policy advisor at the Information Commissioner's Office. So DG Legal has very kindly invited me along today to spend a bit of time introducing the ICO's new accountability framework, which launched in beta form earlier this year. Uh, hopefully, at least some of you have, have seen that, but if not, please do have a look. It's on the website now. Um, so what it is, is it's a tool to help organisations um, to assess whether they have appropriate data protection measures in place and also to help them to demonstrate um, that that's the case in line with GDPR's accountability principle. So I'll start with that one first because accountability is one of those words that might not be understood right away. Um, it's a concept that merits a little bit of explaining. Um, I want to look first at what it means to be accountable um, and then why that really matters and why it's key to effective data protection. I'll briefly explain how the concept of accountability has been specifically incorporated into GDPR. Are we on slide two? <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Um, so accountability means taking uh, responsibility. Um, this is really fundamental to being able to do data protection well. Um, and accountability is also one of the data protection principles. So taking each one of those points at a time, what does it mean to take responsibility for data protection? Well, you take responsibility by thinking about what personal data you have and what you are doing with it. Um, you put in place um, appropriate data protection measures, policies and procedures um, that are proportionate to the size of your organization, maybe what you're doing with it um, and those kind of things. So it's, it's a kind of risk assessment uh, the bigger the risk, the more you should be doing to make sure that you are adequately, adequately protecting people's data. Um, but it isn't a tick box exercise. You need to make sure that what you're doing is effective and that it stays effective. Um, accountability is not something you just do and then that's it, you move on. Um, it should be something that's kept under um, regular review. And it isn't enough that you're happy with what you're doing. You must be able to show others uh, the, the kind of concrete measures that you have put in place. So an important, a really important part of being accountable um, is being able to demonstrate what you are doing, um, whether to regulators like the ICO, the people whose personal data uh, you, you look after, the data subjects, or business partners, that may be the case as well. And increasingly, um, people are looking for those high standards. Um, the ICO may ask to see what you've done to protect personal data. Um, and increasingly, people want to be reassured that an organization can be trusted to handle their personal data appropriately. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows some <laughs> <laughs> this size uh, shows some practical examples of what we mean when we talk about a data protection measure. So it's something concrete and real, like a policy, employing a DPO, uh, keeping a record of your processing. Um, but there isn't a one size fits all approach to, to this. Um, what is appropriate is going to depend on the circumstances and how you're using other people's data. For example, not everyone has to have a DPO. Requirements for records of processing are different for smaller organizations. DPIAs, data protection impact assessments, they're not always needed. So these are just some examples, but the general rule of thumb to keep in mind is that the greater the risk, the more robust your measures should be. Next slide, please. All right. So to understand what we are trying to do by creating an accountability framework, you have to understand why it really matters in the first place and why accountability is 
a key part of data protection. So if you cast your minds back to 2010, long before we'd even heard about COVID and no one could get to work because it snowed so much that year. Yeah, that year, you thought that year was bad. Uh, it's nothing compared to this year. Um, the then known Article 29 Working Party was busy writing a paper called The Future of Privacy. So it said in this paper that data protection requirements were often insufficiently reflected in concrete measures and practices. And that was such an issue because the challenges regarding data protection were continuing to grow year on year, um, hence the need for the GDPR in the first place. So the, as we all know here, the, the importance of data protection really increased as a result of lots of different things. Um, amongst them, the amount of data that's being handled and transferred, um, the complexities of new developments in technology, uh, and the potentially devastating consequences when something does go wrong um, for the data subjects. So getting your accountability right is key to minimizing those growing risks um, and also to building and sustaining people's trust, um, which is actually, when you think about it, what's really needed to encourage participation in the kind of digital economy that we're all moving towards um, and are in right now, let's be honest. Um, and all this makes good business sense too. Um, being accountable can improve your reputation. It can give you a competitive edge over others because people trust you more um, and it can help businesses to grow. Um, I think savvy organizations really understand that and get what accountability is about. Um, and of course, if something does go wrong, the ICO will take your accountability into account when considering um, what kind of regulatory action might be appropriate. Okay, next slide, please. So accountability is not a new concept. Um, and it isn't even completely new law. Um, many of the things that are that were requirements before or good practice, um, you know, are, are the same. Um, what is new is that the new principle makes accountability much more explicit. It's it's in there now with all the other data protection principles as a key. Uh, cornerstone of data pr protection, which puts it at the heart of everything. Um, so it's a legal requirement, just like any any other, um, and it is, of course, enforceable um, as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to talk now about why the ICO wanted to create an accountability framework. So I'll talk about some of the research we did, who the framework is for, what its scope is, and how to use it. I also want to mention the next steps for the accountability framework, and I hope that some of you on this call today may wish to get involved in the future and help us to develop it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the ICO's approach to regulation has always been more in favor of the carrot than the stick. Um, when we set out creating an accountability framework, we had in mind the benefits to organizations and data subjects. Our goal is to increase trust um, in the digital age. Um, and that's something we set out in our information rights strategy and towards accountability was central to that. We also say in our regulatory action policy, and a new version has recently gone out for consultation of this, which some of you may have seen, that accountability is something that we will take into account when considering regulatory action. So we wanted to be clearer about our expectations in view of that. 
Uh, we also wanted to make use of our supervisory experience gained through our work. So, um, you know, we have a lot of experience of looking at these kind of measures um, and what organisations have got in place through audits and investigations. Um, and we really wanted to be more upfront about our main expectations um, and to create a practical tool um, that was going to help uh, organisations to consider their accountability and to demonstrate it. And obviously that makes sense for us to be clear as we can about what we're looking for um, before we go out and look for it. Next slide, please. So in sort of approaching this, there were various strands in, in our research. Um, we consulted internally and considered our own audit processes. Um, we've got a number of toolkits um, which we use to audit organisations. So they formed the backdrop to the framework. Uh, externally, we surveyed the public and received over 100 responses from a wide variety of uh, people. We also held an external workshop at Field Fisher Law in London um, for delegates across uh, all different sectors and different sizes of organisations. And we also spoke to some multinational companies as part of the think tank uh, CIPL, which is the Centre for Information and uh, Policy, Policy Leadership. Next slide, please. Um, so in doing this research, we wanted to understand more about existing accountability practices, um, how people were doing, what they were using, um, and what the main challenges are. We had seen through our own audits at the ICO and other work that there was room to improve um, people's accountability. And we really wanted to know what would um, help people to do that and how we could support organizations in um, sort of designing their own um, internal accountability programs. So we had sketched out some initial ideas um, regarding the, the framework scope, its structure and design. Um, and we, we just wanted to test these uh, um, and see what people thought of them. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have published a more detailed summary of the key findings from all of our research for those who have, you know, a bit of spare time over Christmas. Um, but if you'd rather be doing other things, uh, luckily I've set out the highlights in this slide. Um, it, was, it was great to see from the research how highly regarded the guide to GDPR was and how much it had already supported organisations. Um, there was a, a wide variety of other resources that were being used, um, you know, each of them with different positive aspects of their own. Um, so while we'd anticipate that the ICO's framework would help to establish more universal standards, it's important to see the framework as a complement to these other resources, um, which do different things. Some are more sector specific, for example, uh, it depends what you're looking for. Um, so putting it in that wider context um, continues to be important. The research also confirmed what we already suspected, that there was significant room to improve accountability. Um, respondents indicated that wider cultural change is often what's lacking. Um, and they wanted practical tools to support them in that. So that's kind of getting the buy-in from senior leaders, getting the resources they need, getting the training. It's those kind of um, areas that people said were often barriers um, and holding them back. Um, people were also quite keen to understand more how to demonstrate accountability. Um, as you might expect, there was a strong emphasis on sharing real life practical examples, which is something that we are going to pick up on as part of the next stages of our work to develop some case studies to go along with this. 
um, happily, the majority agreed that the general scope structure and the level of detail, which is always challenging, um, was about right. Um, and they rightly pointed out that it, with something like this, a product like this, it was going to be particularly important to communicate what it is and what it isn't intended to achieve. Um, so the messaging around it is, is very important. So it'd be interesting to look at the feedback and, and see how that's that's gone down. Um, the results also revealed the top three data protection measures that people find most challenging. So at this point, it might have been nice to do some kind of little techie quiz or something with some software, but uh, that's that's not my style. So <laughs> I, I haven't looked into that in advance. Um, so I'm just going to tell you. Um, next slide, please. Um, it, it would have been interesting to know how many of you might have guessed these things. Um, I can't imagine that they would come as a particular surprise, but these are the top three challenging areas. Records of processing came out on top, uh, contracts and third parties and putting in um, policies and procedures in particular um, was, was a bugbear. Um, so we explored all, all those areas in particular at, at, in more depth. In, in some uh, workshops and roundtables to help us develop those parts of the framework. And I think we're gonna come back to these themes that people were raising with us about why they were finding these particular things difficult to do when we look at developing case studies as well. Next slide, please. So having considered the feedback, we decided to draw up a framework um, which is basically for those anybody with responsibilities for making sure their organization puts in place appropriate data protection measures. So that could be senior management, it could be the DPO if there is one, or staff with records management or information security responsibilities. Um, the framework itself, it can help to support any organization, whether large or small, um, with their obligations. The key is that the measures you put in place must be appropriate, they must be risk-based and proportionate. As, as it, it's as said before, but it's, it's, it's worth repeating, that depends on your organisation and what you are doing with personal data um, in, in particular. If you do work for a smaller organisation, um, you'll still find the framework useful, um, I believe, and I hope, um, but you'll most likely benefit in the first instance, uh, I think, from some targeted resources that we have on the website. Um, we've invested a lot in guidance for smaller organisations, so we've got an SME hub, um, for example. In particular, an, an older product, um, which we're in the course of looking at updating at the moment, it's called the, uh, the Data Protection Self-Assessment. There's also a, uh, an assessment for small business owners and, and sole traders. So basically they're kind of a boiled down version of the accountability framework, um, which is something we did earlier. So we do want to update those, but they are on the website now. Um, which uh, have been created specifically with smaller organisations in mind. Um, next slide, please. So the framework supports the foundations of an effective privacy management um, programme. It's not exhaustive um, and it doesn't replace the need for you to comply with all the applicable aspects of of the legislation, um, exercise your own judgment as, as you need to with a principle-based law um, anyway, and use other relevant guidance, such as the guide to GDPR. Uh, it's not sector specific, um, mainly because we want it to be relevant to as broad an audience as possible. In time, we hope to develop case studies which will highlight practical uh, examples and the experience across different sectors and differently sized organizations. Uh, currently it doesn't include uh, 
specific requirements regarding part three and part four of the GDPR um, of the DPA, DPA, but this is something uh, we, we are likely to come back to um, and look to uh, include as our guidance on this is developing. Uh, next slide, please. So the framework itself is divided into 10 uh, different categories, complete with uh, rainbow colored <laughs> illustrations, which I hope make it more interesting. I didn't do these, but you know, I do think it, it's quite a nice touch. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the, those are the ones that we've spent a lot of time talking to other organizations to try and figure out what might work best in terms of these categories, uh, how many we should have, which of them should be joined together. Um, and this is what we came out with. It's not necessarily perfect. It's not the only way to cut it. There's lots of different ways this could have been done. Um, this is our beta. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how pe what people think of the approach we've taken to breaking down the framework. Next slide, please. So for each of the 10 categories that you've just seen, we set out in the framework our key expectations of what we'd expect a reasonably accountable organization to have in place. Again, it's not exhaustive um, and organizations may meet our expectations in slightly different or even unique ways. Um, the example on this slide is taken from the leadership and oversight category. Um, and these are some of our key expectations for that. Um, you can see there that we'd expect to see an organizational structure in place, for example, um, for managing data protection and information governance, which is going to provide strong leadership um, and clear reporting lines. Uh, so for each expectation, we list uh, ways organisations can meet that particular expectation. Again, they're not exhaustive. The example on the slide um, relates to the expectation organisational structure, um, which I, I was just reading out there um, under the main category heading leadership and oversight. Um, and those are some of the ways we've described what we would what we might expect to see um, if, if we came knocking on your door and had a look uh, behind the curtains. Next slide please. Um, so each of those 10 categories includes links to other useful guidance. It's made sense to have a framework that tried to bring all of this stuff together. Um, and some templates that might be useful for people to use, people particularly keen on, on, on the, those being drawn together in, a, in an easier way. Um, and some includes some questions to prompt people into thinking about how they could demonstrate what they've got in place and how effective it is. Um, to support people's assessments of the extent to which they're meeting our expectations, we also produced a self-assessment. Um, you've seen products like this from the ICO before. Um, in this one, you rate whether you're likely to be meeting our expectations, partially meeting our expectations, or not likely to be meeting our expectations. Um, and we explain more about what that means on the landing page for the self-assessment itself. At the end, it, do, it does produce a report. It's got a report function. Um, which is intended to be shared with senior management. Um, there's also an accountability tracker to go along with it. Um, so if, if you think of the self-assessment report is mainly for senior management, um, you can think of the tracker as a product to support the DPO um, or those responsible for putting the data protection measures in place. It's essentially an Excel spreadsheet broken down into tabs to reflect the different categories in the accountability framework. 
what it allows you to do is to add columns um, and keep more detailed notes to monitor, track and review your progress. Um, it also produces some graphs um, which can be used to illustrate what you are doing again. Another potentially useful tool uh, if, to support conversations with senior management about data protection. Next slide, please. Uh, so, as I mentioned at the start, the accountability framework is currently published in its beta form. A consultation on this closed in November and we'll be reviewing those results early next year. Um, there'll also be ongoing opportunities for those who are interested to feedback, possibly in the form of a regular consultation uh, or focus groups exploring particular issues. So, as I said, the framework can be used by any organisation, but we recognise that smaller organisations are likely to benefit from more targeted resources. Um, so we're looking at um, producing a version of the accountability framework, which is particularly targeted at, at that audience. Um, and we're also doing case studies, as I mentioned a couple of times. That may take the form of uh, videos or blogs. It's not necessarily going to be written, uh, but it may include written examples as well. Um, and as we go, we're conscious that there's more to do to promote the benefits of accountability, explore ways to embed it in organisations' culture and to monitor the impact of what, what we're doing. Uh, these are the kind of things that we'll probably look to explore through external uh, focus groups in, in the future. Maybe virtually, who knows? Oh, well, we can live in hope. Um, and the, the last slide, please. Um, so on that note, before I finish, I'd just like to invite anyone who is interested in working with us to develop the accountability framework to get in touch. Um, it may be by volunteering for a case study or to take part in a focus group um, or just to give us some feedback. Um, so that's it. So thanks very much for listening, everyone. Um, appreciate the time. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I thought that was really great and uh, a very good introduction um, to the new materials provided by the ICO. Now, we have got a lot of questions and uh, some of them are, are quite detailed. So what I propose to do is just pick out um, a few and what we will do is after the event, give a comprehensive written answer to all of the Q and A's. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, these will be sent out to everybody. So uh, first one that I'll take, which is uh, quite an easy one. I can answer this one. Does our mail work with Outlook uh, and Office 365? Yes, it absolutely does. That's what we use. So, um, um, I have to say it does. The next question, uh, I think I'm going to ask Matt to answer this one, is um, one of the most, the most common data incident that affects lawyers and law firms, as we well know, is sending an email to the wrong party. So what can be done to minimize the chance of sending it to the wrong person, Matt? Check the bloody email address before you send it. <laughs> So, sorry, I know that's a glib thing to say, but the reality is often the case is that we absolutely know we've sent it to the wrong recipient a microsecond after we've pressed send because that's the first time we actually look at the email address. So, absolutely need to think about double checking the email address. It is by far, in terms of volume and complexity and consequences, the most common breach I come across. It happens, you know, on a weekly basis. It's happening in firms and they don't even know that their staff are doing it. It's incredibly serious. So there are various options. Um, as I said, check it. Some firms choose to disable the autocomplete on email addresses, but that's, you know, often not something that people like because it's quite time consuming. Um, think again about the content of emails. So, you know, I've already said one of the ways to avoid um, messing up very badly is if you've got particularly com confidential information, attach it to the email in a password protected document that even if it does go to the wrong recipient, and of course it shouldn't, but if it did, the recipient couldn't open the document in any event. 
Um, you might want to think about using online data vaults, um, although, you know, I think people have different experiences of using things like egress um, and how irritating that can be, particularly where local authorities use it for sending basic non-confidential communications. So you spend ages logging in only to find out they're confirming something. Um, but, but there are certainly tools like that. Uh, obviously, you've talked about our mail as a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of, sorry, the email checker as another tool. But, but ultimately, uh, you know, there's nothing better than just double checking the email address before you press send. Um, so hopefully those are some, some helpful ways. Um, others on the panel may have other ideas. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's worth mentioning, sorry, it's worth mentioning that the ICO does do what you referred to there, that it's removed corporately the ability for staff to, to use the autofill. And yes, it's, it's mildly annoying, but you do get used to it. And it is, uh, you know, probably much more sensible than not doing it ultimately. Yeah, I can imagine, Elizabeth, that part of the reason for doing that is that it would cause the ICO some embarrassment if you <laughs> misaddressed emails, I guess. Well, yes, I mean, it's important for everybody, but um, yeah, you, you could look at it that way as well. That is particularly important for us because of who we are and that we need to practice what we preach and particularly take care um, to, to do these things. But it's something that we'd re probably recommend other organisations pick up anyway. We do have a free piece of software, which is an Outlook plugin, which we call Email Checker. And we developed this because we had one of, one of our clients did a serious data breach, uh, giving away in an attachment the address of a lady that had suffered domestic violence and had moved address twice already. And to make it worse, she was a, a data protection officer for the local council. So we developed an Outlook plugin, which anybody can have this free of charge. When you press the send button, it says, are you sure these are the right people? And are you sure these are the right attachments? Click to preview attachments. And you know, mm -hmm. it, it's just another layer of protection for those that aren't going to disable um, the autocomplete feature. Mm -hmm. um, next, next question, um, what is involved in getting SSL certification for a website and, and what is the cost? Well, I, I can speak from personal experience that I think it cost me about a hundred pounds. Um, hundred pounds per website is, is fairly typical. And uh, it was really quite, quite, quite straightforward. The next question, which is just also about costs is what about additional costs of implementing Cyber Essentials i.e. multi-factor authentication, I can never say that word, passwords, what sort of budget do you think a firm will need? Maybe a cost per head, so firms of various sizes could get a good idea. I'm going to ask uh, Nick to answer this one, please, Nick. Yeah, sorry, David. I don't think I'm a good one to answer that. I, I've not implemented Cyber Essentials for people, so... I think oh, it's, it, it's funny, it's come up with something that says Nick Cannon would like to answer this question live. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, no, no, I so it's because I'm clearing down the Q and A for you as we go through them. Uh, okay. Well, look, I can. Um... David, can I can I pick in there? Please I do. Please things. do. Um, I would say that actually sometimes it costs you nothing over and above what you're already doing. So some of you may well already be in a position to comply with Cyber Essentials if you set things in your organisation the right way. And if you put some pressure on your IT company and if you implement the right policies uh, and procedures. So, yes, there is a time implication. Um, our policies and procedures are designed around fibre essentials, but I've certainly done some where we've had to make some minor tweaks. But we certainly haven't had to invest in significant additional um, hardware or software in order to be compliant. What, what I'd also say is this. If you do have to invest in additional hardware or software, then are you doing that to be compliant with cyber essentials or are you doing that to meet minimum levels of cyber security for your practice? So I wouldn't, you know, there's a mindset thing here. If you're thinking about it to get a badge, then it seems as if it might be a lot of money for wonder what. If it's spending a bit of money to make sure your systems are robust and your client's data is secure, then that's a much better way to look at this. 
Yes, and then there's obviously the wider cost benefit balance as well. You know, if a bit of investment in some in the basics, which, which is what you should be doing anyway, as as Matt points out, can save you a lot of pain later down the track, not just from the reputational harm to your business, um, but you know, obviously there are. Uh, very substantial regulatory fines which you can be subject to um, so you know that's why I'd say it's it's obviously worth the investment and the cost and taking that time to get it right now. Okay let's just have a, a couple more and see if we can finish it at three and then we'll we'll address the other questions afterwards. Um, are you able to give an example of what data wouldn't be subject to privilege or confidential to our clients? Um, Matt, you're grinning away. Yeah, Polly, that's a bloody horrible question. Um, and the answer is no, but what you can't do is just assume that all of the information on your client file is necessarily automatically subject to legal professional privilege or to the, the common law, to the confidence or confidentiality generally. Um, Nick, have you come across any kind of stonking examples of stuff that never is? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the uh, it can be sort of fairly obvious. I mean, all, all the details you hold about your other the, about the other party. So you could merrily send him or her, um, or sort of rather them, um, a, a copy of data giving their name and address, their date of birth, um, all this stuff, because that's not really privileged. Um, it's not confidential to your client. It's confidential to the recipient, maybe. Um, and it's uh, remarkably unhelpful, which may be part of the name of the game, I'm afraid. Um, Lock your ears, please, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I mean, th there may not be very much left to, to give because anything that is confidential to your clients or anything to do with the case, anything of that nature will definitely be privileged and or confidential, so it won't be disclosable. Um, but there may be, you know, so it, it, it may not be very much, but there is obviously stuff because there is this distinction between privileged um, and confidential information and and the, the data you hold about that particular data subject, which they are entitled to. Just on yeah. that, um, oh, it picks up something from the chat about how can you know that shared drives are confidential? And, and part of the issue here is you may not absolutely know. The issue is what reasonable steps you took to ensure that they were. And so with a lot of this stuff, if you're gonna rely on, on an exemption, um, say for legal professional privilege, then you ought to have gone through a process of making a proper assessment as to whether something is rather than applying it as a blanket. And the same is true of, mm. you know, same principle applies. If you're going to use a piece of software, have a look at the terms of conditions of the software, have a look at their own position on GDPR compliance. Because if something were to go wrong and you'd done none of that due diligence, then I think you'd be in a much worse position than if you'd done all of that due diligence, reached a reasonable conclusion that it was secure and then found out that it wasn't. So, you know, it's about it's about putting yourself in a defensible position and doing as much as you can to, to justify the provisions you've relied on. Um, um, the, the, Brian's asked a question that I think came up last week. Um, <laughs> what do you think should be done to stop people using mobile technology, allowing others to see what they are doing on trains, for example? Company policies and training don't seem to work. <laughs> I mean, Elizabeth, what's your view on that? Um, <laughs> well, you should have, obviously this is something that, that may be increasing at the moment. Um, you know, you, you, you should have a mobile device um, and a home remote working policy that demonstrates how your organization um, is planning to manage the associated security risks. Um, so that should have been thought about and set out. Um, you should have protections in place to uh, avoid unauthorised access um, or the disclosure of the information um, by, on mobile devices. So, for example, that might include encryption or remote wiping uh, capabilities. Um, you know, the usual security measures to protect information uh, that you're processing um, two-factor two authentication I, I struggle with that as well um, so yeah, also have a um, a 
a business need to actually store information in that way in the first place should really think about whether you need to do that you you need to do that um keep the personal data minimized um and it's helpful if your organization um implements a software solution that can set permissions or restrictions for individual devices um as well as an entire class of of devices um, one of the things that your policy should outline is that you not, don't allow equipment, um, information or software to be taken off site without uh, prior of authorization. Um, and you should have a log um, of all the mobile devices and removable media and who they're allocated to. So there's quite a lot of thought that needs to be um, put into that. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, sitting on train, um, with a laptop, there's sort of basic considerations there as well. You know, don't don't start talking on phone when other people can hear you. Think about how close people are sitting, what well, you can see on your screen. Um, I think the ICO gave out some sort of screen protectors um, at some stage. At, um, I don't travel a lot, so I haven't used one. Um, but there are things like that that can make it harder for people to um, actually see um, what you're doing but the bottom line is um, you know make sure it's it's properly considered and worked through in a policy um, and that you're assessing the the risks that your particular organization faces in terms of what it's actually doing in that in that kind of area okay thank you very much for that uh, Elizabeth I'm just going to um um, finish off now just with one very very brief uh, question which I can answer which is how can we obtain a copy of the homeworking checklist please and that's something we've developed well we've developed run about 25 different um, 25 different documents which are checklists uh, policies precedents etc we we tend to only uh, let our retainer clients see it but what we would be willing to do is if uh, if you'd be kind enough to leave a review after this uh, webinar, I'd be very happy to send the checklist to anybody that uh, does um, or is kind enough to, to, to uh, spend a few moments writing a few words. That would be enormously um, appreciated. So I just want to finish by, first of all, thanking um, everybody that's attended um, today's webinar and a huge thanks to uh, Matt, and Nick and, and Elizabeth. Uh, it's been a very, very interesting session and I very much hope that, that people have got something out of uh, today that they weren't aware of uh, previously. Oh, so, I just before everyone goes, David, may I just mention as well as, as your own uh, resources, the ICO has recently published a suite of, of, of information, which is to support people who are working from home. Um, so we've got a security checklist for employers uh, bring your own device uh, guidance, stuff that you should consider, um, top 10 tips on how to work from home securely. And um, there's a blog as well that you can read about the risks involved in a uh, video conferencing. Um, so uh, if you just type um, working from home into the box, search box at the top of the ICO's website, that should bring all that up. So you may, in view of what we've been talking about today, people may find that particularly helpful to have a look at that as well. Well, I think what we should do is add the link to the page in our written Q&A yes. and I'll make sure that happens. Okay, thank you. Not at all. Okay, so once again, uh, everybody, thank you so much um, for attending uh, the webinar. Um, we have got uh, a number of other practice management webinars arranged uh, and also webinars which cover for the first time legal content and we've gone into partnership with a couple of sets of barristers that are going to be uh, producing a, a very wide range of free one hour webinars which um, I hope that uh, many of you will attend and find interesting but in the meantime have a good afternoon and, and see you next time thank you bye bye